Happy Super Bowl Monday, everyone. Congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs, Chris Long, and Ryan Rosillo today on the podcast. Today's episode of the Ryan Rosillo Show on the Ringer Podcast Network is brought to you by State Farm. Just like basketball, the game of life is unpredictable. Talk to a State Farm agent and get a teammate who can help you navigate the unexpected like the Sixers getting smashed by the Celtics when the Celtics didn't have Kemba Walker. Um, That surprised me. The Celtics have been the better team. I just think the Sixers are a bad matchup for the Celtics and no Kemba. But Embiid was one for 11, I think, after he made his first basket. So that surprised me uh, back on Saturday night. Get a teammate who can help you navigate the unexpected. Talk to a State Farm agent today. Chris from Chalk Media. Uh, Check it out. All the Chalk Media stuff on Twitter and Instagram, his YouTube channel. And they have the Killy tapes coming out. So a firsthand look. I've seen some of these videos. They are incredible. They are moving. This is really hard. But the group that Chris brings over to Mount Kilimanjaro every year, uh, they're getting ready to do it again. So they're releasing some of the tapes, the footage of that climb. If it's something you're interested in, in the Waterboys organization, clean water. These guys are over there drilling wells all the time, providing clean water to villages all over that part of Africa. It's an unbelievably moving story if you don't know anything about it. So check it out with the Waterboys org, Chris's stuff. But seeing these guys get ready for this climb um, is incredible. I told them I was going to do it. And then I had no idea it was like 13 days or something. And I was like, oh, that's it's right around the trade deadline. Uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the rotations are starting to lock up a little bit. Uh, yeah. I was like, yeah, I could take the weekend off. I'll go, I'll go to Africa. He's like, dude, you need all this gear and you're there like 13 days. I was like, okay, tell me about the climb itself. And this is what scared me. He goes, the guys you would think would kill it don't necessarily, and the guys you think that wouldn't. Uh, struggle. And I was like, oh man. And then he was like, don't skip leg day. So I was like, all right. So let's talk Super Bowl. Chris is still down in Miami. I am back in Los Angeles. We were there this past week. He stays for the game and it's a great Chiefs comeback. Um, Tied for the second biggest comeback ever, right behind Chris's New England Patriots, Atlanta Falcons. That's actually shocking to me that 10 points is the second biggest comeback of all time. You guys have the biggest. So it's tied for the second biggest comeback. I, 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 I honestly couldn't believe that. I, I, I didn't do enough reading last night because that's insane. Um, yeah, I almost don't it, think it's it real. It felt like much of a comeback to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of, look, there's obviously a lot of things to get into here. I thought it was a great game. We have, we'll have some fun with it too at the end. But give me, I think, what today, whether it was last night, today, thinking back again, because I know what mine is, but I'm going to let you go first. The big takeaway from this game. Well, <clears throat> first off, uh, on the struggle bus this morning here, Rye. So this is uh, this is podcasting hurt. Um, woke up like I was like sleeping in the desert. Uh, you know when you wake up and you're like, I just need some sort of liquid. Found the Martinellis in the uh, in the mini fridge there. The little apple shaped uh, apple juice. Crushed that for to the tune of ten dollars. Um, and here I am, no food. Uh, so here we go. Sorry. Sorry for my voice. Sorry for uh, the presentation here, but I didn't think the game was like that great. I mean, I, I'm not being, I mean, the finish was great. Uh, but for most of the game, I thought it was like a, a decent Super Bowl and uh, two quarterbacks that played bad in stretches um, at different stretches. They didn't really overlap. And then at the end, you had one guy who played the worst game of his career that needed to dig deep and make a couple plays, and he did. And I thought that would be the difference. I thought, you know, it's it's close. San Francisco is probably the better team all around. Uh, but Pat, you know, the third and 15 play, it's just make a little magic happen. And Jimmy didn't get to make any magic happen. He, he wasn't able to. And, and in the end, that's why the Chiefs are, uh, are champions. And so – uh, it's it's on the other side of things. You're looking at it, and you're San Francisco and Shanahan, and the presser is like, "Yeah, Jimmy was all right," you know, and that whole thing. And Jimmy went 12 of 13 at one point for a bunch of yards and a touchdown. Uh, he was hot for a little bit, but when it mattered, I don't know if they feel like they have a guy that in the future, uh, beyond today, um, can make the throws you need to make. Forget Shanahan not running the ball enough. We can get into that, uh, but you know, Jimmy hits Emmanuel Sanders. That game's over. That's really the number one takeaway I have from this because we spend so much time throughout the regular season on quarterbacks, right? I like doing it too. Like who's in the top five? Who's a top 10 guy? Who's a franchise changer, a franchise elevator? Who's a guy who's putting up 300 plus yards but doesn't really mean anything? Because 
if there's anything I've, I've become more confident in is that I'm going to rank quarterbacks based on that third and seven, third and ten, those third and longs where you absolutely need to read the pressure, get rid of the ball, and figure out a way to make a play. And Garoppolo was pretty good last night. But last night was the difference between good and great. And that's why Garoppolo, not just based on the Super Bowl, this isn't a one-game takeaway. This is a full Garoppolo run here where, yeah, there's a handful of games where he stepped up and there's a handful of games where you go, does this guy hold this team back? And he's good. He's good at times. He was good last night, and at the end, he wasn't. And Mahomes is great. And that's why Mahomes is, you know, look, this isn't breaking news, and I, I always... Do you guys, after you win a Super Bowl, is there some sort of like fake doubt support group that they tell all of you guys right after the game? You'd be like, nobody believed in us. But like, dude, everybody thought Pat Mahomes was the best quarterback, yeah. even though Lamar won I didn't MVP. Hear but like, like as, I was in a crowded bar by the end of the game. Like uh, me and Meg, we we made the uh, we made the smart move and we left at halftime. You know, knowing how long the half times are, we uh, we dipped back to South Beach and watched a hotel bar, and that was a great move. So we didn't hear any interviews. Really, it was too loud, but. Um, yeah, I, I think generally everybody nowadays, and I have no idea who said it or didn't say it, so I'm not taking shots. I'm just saying, like, everybody believed in the Chiefs, except for, like, the first six, eight weeks of the season when they had their injuries and they had the dip. No doubt about it. They they were counted out at one point, but we're, we're well beyond that. I think that that offense um, – is one of the most, I mean, like I've compared it before, and I'm sure a bunch of people have, to the Golden State offense. Uh, it's just, it's runs. I mean, no lead is safe. We saw that in three playoff games. Um, and, and it happens fast, I mean, in the blink of an eye. So I, I actually think that, you know, I'm being a little harsh bleeding with Jimmy G as the story. I sat there last night after the game, and I'm, I was reading my timeline a little bit, and it was all about Jimmy and Kyle. What about the San Francisco defense? Do they get a pass for, for giving up three scores late? Third and 15. I mean, we're looking at a situation where you're down 20 to 10. So they put up three touchdowns in the fourth quarter. They only needed half the quarter to do it. Uh, 8.53, down 20-10, and then a third and 15, a little f- bit further into the game there. And there's this number they had on Van Pelt show last night where third and 15 or longer, the average QBR for quarterbacks is six, and Mahomes is like in the 90s. It's, well, it's, it was it's almost impossible. like it forced him into ha- – like like that situation, it, it was almost like I, I felt last night that they were underneath a lot. And I think go, I got to go back and look at the coverages and whatnot, but I, I feel like, you know, that's how Pat was living, and he wasn't making good throws. I mean, you know, he threw behind Hill on the pick and, you know – The other pick was stuff. even worse. Yeah, the other pick was one of the worst passes I've ever seen him throw. I couldn't believe it. You know, for me, it was it – was, <laughs> It was like, when is he going to push the ball? Like, when are we going to see him take shots? I know that I don't know what Kelsey's final numbers were, but they didn't have to to, to win with Kelsey for most of the night. It wasn't like Hill was otherworldly, but when they had to make a play and they were down, it, it's like it brings out the best in Pat, and and that's you know the risk taking, the the pushing the ball down the field, and and they they did a nice job in um, on both sides of the ball of just managing. The run game. I'm not saying they were world beaters on either side, but for a team that you thought would have just a terrible mismatch on the defensive side of the football, I don't know what the final numbers were, but it didn't feel like a game. And maybe that's because Kyle went away from it that the Niners could just control the clock continually. Um, and and so hats off to Kansas City and Spags uh, for for kind of I think Spags did the but this is the best job Spags ever did. I mean, including the Giants years to me. Um, because the Giants' front sevens were loaded. And so, you know, the Kansas City defense deserves some credit. I mean, we were told that this was going to be a high-scoring game in San Francisco. You can't slow them down. I think the biggest thing for that defense, too, bouncing around, was that first 15, that script, that if you're a defensive player, you know that the, the, you know the first 15 are scripted and you got your best stuff, uh, their designer plays, and Shanahan's got the cream of the crop type designer plays, and, and they came out of the gates that first drive, and I was like, oh, no. I mean, it was as a defensive player, I'm watching it, and when you play in the Super Bowl, you can't catch your breath the first 10 minutes. So when you're running laterally and, you know, it's perimeter plays, it's stuff right at you, it's play action, it's no two plays look the same in the beginning there. And I'm like watching on the field, I'm like, God, if they don't get a stop and make this three, not seven, it's going to be a long day. So Spag's defense stepped up at different points in the day. And again, I'm looking at San Francisco's defense. I was told they were historically good. Um, 
Now, they have some great players. Bosa, by the way, he was double-digit in pressures last night. So, I mean, he's, he's shown to be everything he's cracked up to be all season long. They have a bright future on defense. But they got some work to do because that's not the Ravens' defense. The Ravens' defense, I don't know. Uh, you know, you want to be a historically good defense, you can't give up three scores in the fourth. So, all right, let's, let's back it up a little bit on this, um, only because I think there was something that you said that really was, was the thought I kept having in my head. I go, you know, as Kansas City gets down here, and like win probability at that point when they're down 10, it's, it's a 3% win probability. I hate win probability so much. Like win probability is different <laughs> for Kansas City. Win probability is different when it's Patrick Mahomes. And at no point am I like they're out of this thing because of him and because of what we've just seen. And your Golden State Warriors analogy is perfect because I feel like Mahomes plays football the way Steph first played basketball when it was like, wait a minute, is this real? Like, is he just going to pull up from 30? He's going to hit all these threes. He's going to take even more threes and become more efficient. He's the MVP. Like, they're yeah. going to win a title. Like, this is going to work. Like, how good can this guy be? Now, I don't know that, look, no one's sitting there saying Steph Curry is going to end up being the best player of all time. And it was still kind of hard to debate. You know, he is he's better than LeBron, even though he was statistically better than LeBron and more productive when he was winning those MVPs. But then there was kind of like little things you're like, do I really want to say that this guy's a better basketball player than LeBron? Mahomes can do all of those things in a game that doesn't really allow itself to be dominated that way. And there's no question he's the best quarterback in the world. And I don't know really what the ceiling on what he can be is. And, you know, we could be sitting here, if not for an offsides play last year, they would have beaten the Rams. We could be talking about two Super Bowls. But I'm yeah. I'm at home writing in my notes going, either Kansas City starts to open this thing up or San Francisco's four, which is almost four all night. I rarely saw a fifth guy go for San Francisco. And they were disruptive. I know Mahomes is Mr. Arm Angle, Mr. Bad Feet, Bad Hips, all that stuff, which I think is what makes him great is he can do all those things. But he seemed really loose, exceptionally loose with the way he was setting up. They were rolling him away from that pressure and kind of design rollouts, and he was just sort of chucking it. And to your point, like as we're all waiting for that big play, he had only one completion that was 10 or more air yards so the ball actually 10 or more yards yeah. in the air it was that Watkins play in the first half to the left side that was sort of like a broken off coverage and that was it until he hit that big one to Hill for 44 yards so never thought they were out of it and as bad as he was and he was that really felt like the the defining moment where are they down and now they have to play this way and that's actually worse for San Francisco well that's the scary thing um you know, they did not play perfect, as we've talked about at length, and, you know, they're Super Bowl champions, and they beat a team that, um, you know, deserves a lot of credit. Sure, absolutely. Um, I thought we've been battling this uphill battle with San Francisco all year where, where you know, are we giving them their due? Do they deserve to be in the Super Bowl? Absolutely. Uh, they yeah. kicked everybody's ass down the stretch. Uh, you know, Jimmy barely had to throw the ball, but that was that ended up being uh, the big takeaway is that you, that your quarterback can't make the throws. But Kansas City, um, you know, to me, the scary part is defense. You've got some personnel that you can improve on. Like the defense is going to improve from a personnel standpoint. And then offensively, uh, they, they did not play their best game. They scored 31 on the San Francisco 49ers and their Super Bowl champs. So what does that what does that mean for the future, uh, the power shift in the NFL? And, you know, I look back at that Patriots uh, game where they go to Foxborough and win on the road. It felt like Andy got a monkey off his back. And then watching, you know, the, the Kevin Harlan thing that's that's gone viral now where he's calling both games and, and the Patriots lose to the Dolphins and the Kansas City Chiefs secure home field and the bye, or they, they secure the bye. Um, you know, leapfrogging New England, it's just this seismic shift in the power struggle in the AFC. And I know that for a while there all year, we're like, this is a Baltimore thing the next five, ten years. Well, look, look who it is. <laughs> It's it's the best quarterback in the game, along with Russ, um, you know, and and he's not going anywhere for a while. And neither is Andy. Yeah, Andy now two hundred and seven yeah. wins, a bunch of postseason wins. Um, he's going to Canton because of this. Um, and you know now we can talk about him. You know we can talk about him among some of the other greats the way he should be talked about. Yeah, I'm going to need Baltimore to get a playoff win before I'm ready to pencil him into the next five of these. And well, uh, Lamar people, had a great that's year. How people talk. 
look, and I'm I'm not anti Baltimore. I'm just saying, no, but you know, it's 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 the shiny object, and it's it's a program that's been being like the thing about Kansas City is they were building that program before Pat came on. Like Pat fell in their laps, so they've been at this a while. Um, you know, it's it's not something new. It's not a shiny object. So it should not surprise anybody that they have a chance to dominate for the next. That's realistic to talk about. You know, you have that centerpiece. You have a legendary coach. You have personnel that scares the the shit out of people uh, in Kansas City skill guys, and you can improve defensively this off season as well. So let's look at what's become. I think the biggest talking point. So I was surprised that you said it seemed like a lot of Kyle. It seemed like a lot of Jimmy. I think it's been all Kyle Shanahan. I have no excuse for why he didn't call a timeout at the end. They could have gotten the ball back at like one forty nine. They got it back at like fifty six. Then they actually did move the ball a little bit. So then they were trying to figure out. There's even a clip of a ref turning to show. After they were about to punt Kansas City, the ref looks at him. He's like, all right, I guess you're not calling the timeout. John Lynch, there's a clip of him going, let me see the timeout. Shanahan said afterwards he liked where they were at at 10-10. But as much as there are some things that I probably take just sarcastic swipes at when it comes to the analytic world, I thought the analytic world taught us that like never give away a possession. And... I, you know, I, I would, I don't care. I, you know what I mean? Like give yourself a little bit of a chance here. See what happens. Maybe you get a PI, although the game was pretty clean throughout most. And then it kind of got all over the place with some of the different calls. I didn't love the Kittle call. Um, but some people thought, yeah, it was and that was call. a big turning point, right? I mean, it like was. that, that right there. Well, first off, I mean, everybody was talking about it, but the timeout strategy before the half. And part of that might be the trust in Jimmy G or lack thereof. But, you know, if you're going to take a lack. shot downfield, you know, maybe maybe take a timeout uh, before, you know, it runs down under a minute and you, you would receive a punt, um, if I'm remembering that correctly. But, yeah, I didn't love the call. That would have changed things a lot. You know, I, I'm not saying Shanahan's blameless. He's he's He shares a big piece of this pie. I'm just saying that, you know, he's the, he's the headline. But let's not lose the fact that the defense couldn't get a stop in the fourth. You know, he, he ran the ball at a lower click than he did in the Patriots Super Bowl. Um, with the lead. Uh, I think I saw where Ed Werder said it was 14 plays a lead in the second half, nine throws. That's a higher drop back percentage than the Super Bowl. Um, so it's like when Kyle Shanahan woke up yesterday and I was pulling for him because I think he's a good coach. I don't think he, he thought he'd be going back to the team hotel but like it was Groundhog Day in a sense. Uh, that had to be the last thing he expected, but it was like he just couldn't help it. Yeah, I want to go over those plays because you're right. Like, as I, I mentioned here, they could have called the timeout at 148. They got the ball at 59 after the punt. So then you're like, okay, why are you giving away this possession? Um, and I even wrote down on my notes, I go, that'll be something like, there should be a contest, something that happens that we'll forget about because that team won the game. And if San Francisco were going to win, no one would really care about this and no one would ever really remember. But that was the kind of thing where you're like, why are you giving away this possession? You never know what could happen here. And even though he doesn't trust Garoppolo, which is fairly obvious, he needed to trust him a little bit later on. So let's go over the play call stuff because to just say, hey, this is how many times they drop back. I think you have to go possession by possession or actually really play by play. So Mahomes throws his second pick on that bad throw behind Hill off of Hill's hands. And now we're looking at... It's in plus just, territory too, Rye. Not to mention, I mean, so the Chiefs are moving the ball a lot late. I mean, to be to be fair to, you know, defense shouldering some blame, but yeah. Um, right. They're at the, on that, that pick, it's third and six of the San Francisco 23. And I'm thinking, like, even if they don't get that, and Kansas City was terrible on third down for most of the game until they picked it up. They were one of six to start. But on that third and six, like I'm at home going, okay, you know, call it before it happens. If they don't get it, I'm like, well, of course you just kick the field goal because then all you need is the touch. Like there are times where Kansas City was aggressive where I understood it, but in that spot, I'm like, they're going to have to go ahead and kick the field goal. So that's wiping out three points on that pick uh, beyond just turning the football over. San Francisco starts at their own yeah. 20. Moster, a six yard run, second and four. Garoppolo, a short pass over the middle um, to Kittle for 12 yards. Okay. So I, don't, I doubt anybody hated that. Now it's at the 38, their own 38. Mostert left side for one yard, stuffed. And Spagnolo definitely did a better job of overloading the pressure. He was bringing guys up. Garoppolo on first and 10, Mostert for a yard. Okay, Garoppolo to uh, Debo for uh, nothing. That was an incomplete pass. And then third and nine, you're like, okay, what are they going to do? So I guess you could be mad at the Debo pass, but they get a false start. So it's third and 14. He's got to throw the football there. 
He's got to throw the football. Thing, there's a false start in there that totally derails things. Shanahan didn't false start. I mean, like there's there's other issues as well as you're you're pointing out. Right. So then Garoppolo ran out of bounds on that one. Didn't you know? I don't know what he's seeing there. He missed a Debo in the flat on one of these um, one of these series. He changed into a pass play out of a run. Okay, so that means Kansas City then goes right down the field, ten plays, eighty three yards, and two forty, and that leads to the Kelsey touchdown from the one yard line on first and goal from the one, and that was after they got that PI. San Francisco gets the ball back. They're at their own twenty. Mostert left tackle for five yards. Garoppolo incomplete to Kittle on second and five. Garoppolo on the born passes, I think, is when he missed Kittle wide open. When Kittle looked back at everybody, like, what the hell is going on? And so three and out there, you know, those are a couple pass plays where maybe I can understand. But That's if you saw something from Shanahan, me. right, Shanahan was was kind of doing this thing where it's like, all right, they're loading up. Well, I'm going to do the thing you you think I'm not going to do, but that's the one that's a little right. harder to defend after the fact, even though if you go back and actually watch some of the clips, you're like, all right, well, Kittle was open. Kittle was open, and he didn't yeah. even look at him. Yeah, Kittle was open, and, you know, we mentioned the Sanders pass that he missed. Um, these are throws that if your quarterback hits them, uh, you know, and again, you know, Shanahan, I don't know if he was throwing Jimmy under the bus, but after the game, you know, he played all right. That was kind of the – that was kind of – and it's true he played all right, but you, 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 you don't know, want to hear you that. You know yeah. that when you make you make that statement, <laughs> it's it's going to echo. And I don't know that you – I think Shanahan's a smart guy. I don't know that he's saying that thoughtlessly. Yeah, I also think that Shanahan has kind of a like an abrasive personality, not to say he's a dick, but this has even been a topic. It's like he's the Miles Teller of coaching. Where he has to there's answer. No, yeah, there's no frills. By the way, I saw Miles the other night. Oh, you did? I heard he's still talking. Late night, just rolled up. Oh, he did? Yeah. I don't know. I've, I've been hearing just some stuff in the, the streets. Scene, you know, cool Hollywood shirt, bowling looking shirt, but like stylish. I don't know where those guys get him. those shirts. Don't you? Aren't you a little he's curious? Cool. Like, he's just a cool guy. I don't know. I, I, you better keep my name out of his mouth. I've been hearing some stuff out in the streets. <laughs> Okay, so Kansas City gets the ball back uh, at their own 35, and that leads to the Damian Williams pass, the touchdown on third and goal. Just a side note here, I don't know how many times you've seen that. They called it a touchdown on the field, going to the right pylon, his right foot stepped out of bounds, but there's no angle unless we got moon cam that can go right down where the lines are perfectly lined up and not skewed by a camera angle. I know some people think – I don't know how anyone can say definitively in or out of bounds before the ball actually touched the very front of the plane. I, I thought he was out, um, but okay. I also thought that if you're Kansas City – what? Yeah, I know. I know <laughs> I'm anybody, just laughing. This good setup. Well, you know, we were all sitting there. In the, it's funny. In the bar, everybody's got a different opinion. I mean, that's the best place to watch a replay. Um, and people Which bar are were you nuts at? Both ways. I was at the Lowe's uh, Hotel nice. Bar. Yeah, you know, we were staying at the lows. So, you know, by, at, by the time we got back there, I felt just so relaxed. I mean, the Super Bowl is great. What an atmosphere. But, you know, it's just a lot. Of, it's a lot. And, you know. You had to do two extra that, nights. Yeah. I had to do two extra nights. I had to, like, talk, you know, which is nerve-wracking. I had to talk on the field and give Calais the trophy. And that was terrifying. Like, you're like, nobody wants to hear from me. I just I, – this is 15 more seconds than I want to be down here speaking uh, because everybody's like, let's get on with the game, community service guy. Okay, you know, just an aside, like, sometimes we can forget, and I think list, I forget, and I'm your buddy, but it's like, hey, what's Chris doing? Oh, he has to go present the Man of the Year award on the field before the Super Bowl starts because that's actually what yeah, he's here and for. Feel, and feel <laughs> stupid as hell to be out there. I'm like, this is like, well, I love it. I mean, it's it is the most prestigious thing in the world. But I just, I feel you, you the feel unworthy being down there. It's it's it's. There's a lot of you know they're doing the the, the best hundred players of all time. Like you're standing on the field. I'm like, I'm in the the suite looking around, and I'm like. I'm in the the lunch line, kind of the buffet line, and there's really good food. And I'm like, you know, Barry Sanders is in front of me with his new red jacket. And I'm like, you know, he's he's looking at the food. And I'm like, do I cut around him? Because I'm seeing three buffet trays in front of him is what I want. Like, do I cut Barry Sanders? Is he going to no, be you like, can't. You, can't. you know, so I he just wouldn't have mind you. He's so cool, by the way. Right. But, um, you know, stuff like that, you know, you're just like, why am I here? You know, he's like, you know, I'm like, uh, passing LT, 
you know, in the, in, in the suite, like, by the way, in that suite, um, the NFL, they, they do, they do, they do a great job. Like everybody there, security people, et cetera, credential people. It's a stressful time. Like on the field before Super Bowl, it's, it's chaos. And they do come around and do credential checks and whatnot, but they did like a, a sweet sweep and, um, they were getting everybody's wristbands and somebody's like, Hey, they're, they're trying to, they're making Jerry Rice go get a wristband. Like somebody, this is like all the top 100 players up there. Somebody was like, nah, man, you don't have a wristband. They're like Jerry Rice. <laughs> I'm like, take my wristband. But it like, happens. You're right. Cause it's somebody who doesn't gonna, know. Right. I mean, it's just a yeah, guy. I don't think the kid knew that it was Jerry Rice. And by the way, Jerry Rice is stressed out watching you know, the Niners and he really cares about the Niners and Jerry Rice was super cool about it. I'm just watching him and he didn't like throw a fit, nothing. He's like, I'll go get it. If I need to go get it, like, et cetera, it's just five minute ordeal. But you just, the entire time you're like, you're like, uh, I know they want to get on with the game. Let me just not screw this up. And by the way, after you present the award, which is awesome. And congrats to Calais Campbell. You know, it's funny to me, like me and Calais, we were at like ACC media day in uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina, you know, it feels like yesterday. And then I'm handing him that trophy. So he's really deserving. All the nominees are awesome. The thing that sucks, you got to give it to one person. But, um, you know, right after I'm like, I remember, you know, I, I hand off this this award that makes me look like such a great guy. I'm like, oh, I got the Demi Lovato over on the national anthem. Put him on the field, and I can't put the timer on. <laughs> so so I, I'm reminded that, yes, I do a lot of good work, but I'm also a shithead. <laughs> and by the way, Demi Lovato cruised through that national anthem and took food off my uh, my kid's table. Um, and you know, she's passing in the hall and everybody's like, great job, Demi. I'm like, I wanted to be like, Hey man, what was that about? Could have home of the brave could have been sold a little longer. Yeah. Uh, she was great though. She was incredible. Um, she was great and, though. She was great. America the can, beautiful was great as well. Yeah. You could tell the first note on that one. I was like, this one's going deep. Um, to I know just, I wish I had gotten over on that one, but I didn't see it to back up. Uh, the the legend of Chris, true or false? Did you accept the Man of the Year award last year in Atlanta, and then go to the Northside Tavern by yourself and watch the game from there? Uh, I didn't go to the. I don't know. I didn't go to the the. No, I watched the game uh, at the game, but we did go to the Northside Tavern after. Okay. All right. All right. I'm, I'm just... not above going to the Northside Tavern alone instead of going to the Super Bowl. At I all. know. There's just a rumor Shout out to there. Northside Tavern. I know Northside should be just giving us money at this point. Um, there was a rumor out there going around, and then everybody was asking me. They were like, "Did he do that?" And I go, "I actually don't know," because now I've been, I think I've counted it up, eleven Super Bowl weeks, and I've never gone to the game. And I just, I could never it's, get back to Hartford. I could never get back to it's Hartford. Cool, and, but I'm looking at the stands, and somebody from the NFL is like, "You see those seats right there? They're like uh, these big club." couchy looking seats on the 50 yard line down the field. He's like, those go for 160 grand. I'm like, man, that's an expensive suite. They're like, no, a seat. <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah. No, thanks. Just okay. Let's, let's finish. Um, cause I want to do a couple fun Super Bowl observation deals, but I want to finish that Shanahan possession. Um, cause well, I don't know if it even matters anymore. We knew what happened, but look, they went, uh, I'm going to have to run. We knew what happened. Yeah. We, we know what happened. Here's here's kind of my point. Like, I have more of a problem with the way Garoppolo played. You see the pressure that's coming. They overloaded that one side with, like, five guys. They brought six, I think, all together. And, you know, like, to the, the top point of this whole thing is, like, Jimmy not stepping up in that moment wasn't entirely shocking. Seeing Mahomes step up is exactly what I would expect. Now, let's also do this. Because you mentioned Andy Reid. 21 seasons in, he gets a Super Bowl. You see he's going to Canton. He, 15 years in the playoffs, I think seven conference championship games. And he finally gets a Super Bowl in his second trip there. People have told us for years this guy is as good as anyone in dialing up an offense, creating a system, all the different things that you would want. Uh, I actually was shocked he got back into coaching as quickly as he did, considering losing his son and that kind of tragedy. But maybe that's exactly what he needed um, to get back to work. You know, some people need a break, some people need to be distracted with work. I don't know, but we know it's an awful story. And everyone last night, in unison, 
just congratulating, celebrating Andy Reid for getting it. And I felt great for him too. But I also know I wasn't one of the many media members out there who thought he was a total moron when it came to playoff execution. Now, the playoff resume is disappointing, but you know a few clock management screw-ups should not then become your legacy. So for everybody that was congratulating him, I wonder how many people also were just ripping him all the time, basically saying that he's incapable of winning the big game. When I think whenever you say that stuff, whenever we talk about players and it happens a lot in basketball, like, hey, this guy's good, but he'll never win a championship. It's so easy to say that. And it's really easy to be right a lot because the, the odds are stacked against you to ever get this done. But to say somebody is actually incapable of winning, I think Andy Reid, somebody who's had some bad losses, a couple moments that didn't work. Like whenever you're going to lose, those moments look even worse. Who is a great coach, respected as much as anybody by his peers, which means a lot. And now things have changed. And we do this thing where it's like, yeah, we kind of shit on you for like 15, 20 years. But you know what? You won. So here's a big old hug. And for those that did All that. All the feels. It, All the feels. It's, it's just. And I know I'm like, I'm not being hypocritical here because I know what I'm like. With I rarely, rarely will ever say this guy sucks so bad. He's never going to win. Like, I don't really say that very often. A couple basketball players. And for everybody that's crushing Kyle Shanahan today, okay? <laughs> Kyle Shanahan, who would be, I think, consumed differently on Super Bowl Sunday night and Monday morning if he didn't have the game where he was up 28-3 in the game where you guys came back and won. But since that's on his resume, then it's like, oh, look at what Shanahan did again. He screwed up. I'm telling you, if you go back to the video of all of those plays of the last three possessions, not including the final desperation interception by Garoppolo, because that one didn't really count. I'm not even counting that one. It's not as bad as you think, but now it becomes his legacy where it's like, oh, this guy's really good, offensive genius, but in the big game, can't get it done when he rolled through his previous two playoff games. In the NFC Championship, I'm sorry, I think that's also a very big game. So I think it's a very similar like timeline of watch how much you beat on these guys because the public seems to be so quick to hug you and then acting as if you changed when you win. Winning is so weird in the way where it's like, okay, yeah, all those things I thought about you now I guess aren't true, so I'm just going to pretend I never said them. Jimmy makes that throw. Shanahan has a ring. The um, Sanders throw. Mm, yeah, and and I'm not like, and there's a hundred other things that could have gone right or wrong for the Niners in that game, so it's this carousel of what ifs, and that's the way football is, and so, you know, I, I, I do think it's interesting that you bring up the, the read point Although everybody loves to love Andy Reid, he's a lovable dude. You hear what his players talk about. Um, you know about his offensive uh, genius kind of persona. Um, you know, like the option last night on fourth and one. I'm sitting there up in the suite, and there's defensive guys, and we're sitting there, and we're going like, how do you play that option? Like, I'm thinking to myself, if I'm Nick Bosa, the back's lined up opposite me, and he comes across, and they run a speed option, essentially. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing. There, there's so many things as you watch the game with other players and back-end guys that they ooh and ah over what Andy Reid does. Um, but he pairs that with his his emotional intelligence, his likability as a coach. And I think that's why he's so loved. But he's had this cloud over his head, to your point. And, you know, when, to your point, he, he, he wins the one big one, now all of a sudden it's, it's all praise, and we acted like we didn't kill him for 20 years. Um, Shanahan's a guy that's going to have this cloud hanging over his head, and there will be a lot of people that say he'll never win the big one because of these two games. How about he has the capability to get to the big one, uh, you know, for the, for the foreseeable future, even with Jimmy G? Um, so, so I'll take the guy that can get me to the big one and see if he'll learn his lesson uh, after his two big failures. And by the way, this isolated for any other coach is not a big deal. It's a big deal. But you're not pointing the finger at Kyle if there wasn't a 28 to three. And by the way, Kyle wasn't the head coach in Atlanta. Kyle also wasn't, you know, I think he's given up. I think the defenses on on Kyle Shanahan offensively called teams in Super Bowls have given up like 40 fourth quarter points. I mean, I have the number. uh, It's it's um, crazy. Shanahan's team has been outscored 46 to zero inside the fourth quarter, 10 minute mark of his last two Super Bowls. Um, again, he's kind of getting credited with being the head coach now, <laughs> somehow. Yeah, he wasn't the head coach in Atlanta. <laughs> Dan Quinn's a defensive coach. Right, right. 46 to so, nothing at that point. By the way, he didn't, like, listen, I, I think it, it was dumb 
down the stretch, the 28 to three thing. I know I was there and I used to joke about it and laugh about it, but I also know that Kyle Shanahan is a hell of a football coach. He'll be back. Um, and Kyle Shanahan didn't, Trey Flowers didn't beat Kyle Shanahan for a sack. You know, uh, Kyle Shanahan didn't hold me at the end of the game. You know, like they, they kick a field goal there. It's over. They hold up in protection. It's over to your point. Like, you know, Kittle's open. You hit he missed him. Debo it's in the over. flat. He missed Sanders by Debo a few in the yards. Flat. You uh, know, uh, Sanders down the field. So yeah, there's blame to go around, but I am very happy for Andy, man. I, I said last night, I was like, he might be the one guy, you know, and I, um, he might be the, I, I used to think this about Steve Irwin. He's the guy who could like save the internet that everybody, no matter what you believe in or who you're pulling for, loves Steve Irwin online. And that's very rare. Andy Reid is, is, is like Steve Irwin that way. Andy Reid can bring the timeline together. He's a very rare individual that everybody is happy for when they win. And I didn't actually see anybody come with like an angle of why Andy Reid is a shithead, which is really rare for Twitter last night. We'll do some quick hit observations on the game, everything around Miami. The big game might be over, though, but the action isn't slowing down just yet because, as we know, as one football season ends, another one, we know that new one, is about to begin. Celebrate the kickoff of the new professional football season starting this weekend with DraftKings, the leader in one-day fantasy football. Draft your lineup and feel the sweat like never before. Every run, throw, and catch mean more with a DraftKings lineup on the line. It's simple. Just draft your lineup, stay under the salary cap, and see how your team stacks up against the competition. So if you've been thinking about trying a new type of one-day fantasy football, now is the time to play because nothing adds to the sweat of watching the games quite like having a shot at over $100,000 in prizes. Download the DraftKings app now. Use the code RUSSILLO, R-U-S-S-I-L-L-O. New users enter the code RUSSILLO, R-U-S-S-I-L-L-O, during sign-up and play for a shot at $100,000 in prizes this weekend. That's code RUSSILLO. Play for a shot at $100,000 in prizes this weekend only at DraftKings. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Let's do some quick hitter game stuff and then some fun Super Bowl stuff. Shout out to Chris Jones. Chris Jones. He Chris was Jones. huge in moments there. The padded, uh, batted down passes, which, you know, like that's not a play call. That's not even on Jimmy, really. I mean, the guy gets a hand up and has to get his hand in the passing lane perfectly. Um, that's just a great play by the defense. Uh, Breland was really good in this game. Um, another thing that I noticed, and I don't know if you did. Well, you didn't because you were watching at a bar and then we're at the game. Troy Aikman pointed out six times by my count one-on-one coverage that Mahomes had with different matchups. Six times. Yeah. One of the six was called back because of a penalty, but on all six, Mahomes never looked at the guy. He never looked at the guy. And as I'm going, how is Patrick Mahomes having the worst game that I've ever seen him have? And I don't know statistically if there was – now, you know, it'll get it'll – get, all kind of combined together where you go statistically this isn't the worst there's these other games well yeah because he had those last eight minutes but I Aikman's pointing it out and Mahomes is never looking that way which it, during the game of, of him not playing well I'm like what how is Troy seeing this and Mahomes isn't seeing one-on-one coverage and for yeah. Richard Sherman who is always a big part of the story uh, it was kind of weird revealing throughout the week and running into different guys. And I don't know if it's just people being critical of Sherman or, or, you know, I guess I could just use the term haters, but they were like, yeah, Sherman in coverage, man, like this thing's overblown. And then Troy kept pointing it out of the game where there was that big Watkins throw where it was almost like, Hey, you should be looking to attack Sherman whenever he's one-on-one without help. And that seemed to be something that Troy was hitting on and something I was hearing from different football guys throughout the week on that, like this idea that Sherman is one of the lockdown corners well, in certain ways, he's really good, but he's also very vulnerable, and yet Mahomes didn't seem to be able to take advantage of that until that big throw to Watkins late. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the Watkins uh, throw where he kind of stacked him and, and got by him and, uh, you know, that, that kind of circle circulating around the internet. Uh, you know, <clears throat> coverage is, is complicated. It's like, you know, quarterbacks – not all of them can play any scheme. And, you know, Richard's one of the best to ever do it, but there's some things that uh, aren't his strengths. And especially this late in the season, being an older guy now, you know, this has been a long postseason, you know, um, and these runs are long. So I don't know how fresh he's feeling. I don't know if he's dealing with an injury or anything like that. Um, But, yeah, uh, it's – 
it's tough. It's tough to see that. Uh, it's it's tough because you know he's one of the best, and it just goes to show how unforgiving our game is. And like, you get on that big stage in the Super Bowl, and you can be a Hall of Famer, but you know you can have a bad play, and it can just happen to be in front of hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. So, you know, as as hard as as Sherm has fought to get up off the mat after that Achilles and people did leave him for dead. We do that thing where it's Absolutely. overblown where people yep. like you can people counted Sherm out and he's, he's a battler and he, you know, you can, you can like him or, or hate him. You can be critical of certain things he's done um, or said, but you got to respect his, his grind uh, and his attitude and his toughness. But, you know, you get on that stage and it's one play and that can affect your legacy one way or another. I don't think it does. No, uh, I know. No. Famer to me. Yeah, but but you know you have a couple bad plays and people freak out. And yeah, to your point, Mahomes was missing you know a, a lot. Um, and I was interested. How did you think Troy and, and Joe did? But they're great, great. Yeah, I, I always think Joe's great. I, I I talked about this on my pod last week. I was like, I was like, I I don't understand the Joe Buck hatred. Yeah, I honestly the the it's become almost a thing and then he gets interviewed about it and then I did a podcast with him and it wasn't like, "Hey, how does it feel to be hated?" It was almost like, "Hey, how does it feel to be every time you're interviewed you're asked about being hated?" So I think collectively right. everybody should just ban it from their question repertoire and just move on from it because he's just too good. And you know what's always funny he's like really Tariko? Tariko is that guy where there are times I'm like, "Oh my god, did he make a mistake?" and then I'll rewind it. I'll go, "Nope, he didn't." Joe's in that same league. Like, wait a minute, did he say the wrong team? I'm like, nope, he didn't. He phrased it in a way that made it sound like he was doing something different, but he wasn't. And Tariko's so freaking good. I always point this out. But you can almost tell if Tariko starts the sentence in a way that he didn't want to say it, and then he saves it uh-huh. mid-sentence and ties it up in a way that you would have never noticed. And I, I would have never noticed if I didn't do this for a living. But like sometimes in Tariko, I'll just sit at home and I'll hear him say a line. I go, oh, he started that where he didn't want to, and then he tied it up perfectly in a bow and then transitioned perfectly and set up with the perfect question. I mean, Tariko's an alien, first of all. But I, I think Joe so- Buck is... You know, you know more than me, and I was thinking about that because I know Joe. Like, I'm not being a homer here. If I didn't think Joe was very good, and I know him, I'm just not going to say anything. But like, I posted so something good. on the on on, yeah. on Instagram the other day, and it was like a call from the Eagles game, the uh, NFC Championship a couple years ago. It was like two years ago today, and he had this brilliant call on the Pat Robinson uh, pick six, and and you know some of the comments were just like that stuff's. I I don't think enough people know how much is going on in the booth up there, right? Like they have people in their ear, they got notes, they got, you know, like cross talking. I, I don't know how you do it. And what are they looking at? Are they looking at the TV or are they looking at the field? Everybody's different. Um, some guys are field guys. I think you're probably better off as a, as the analyst looking at the field. Cause you can see everything. Um, the TV replay, like I used to always think it was funny when, when the Sunday night old football crew, like Paul McGuire and those guys would act like they were predicting the flag when you can just see, the judge making the call and who it's against before it's announced to the television, right. which isn't always in the right. shot. You're like, oh, I think this is going to be a hold uh, on uh, on Seattle here. And you're like, no, you just saw them do that. Um, you have a spotter who's spotting out different things. Usually that spotter, maybe there's an extra stats guy. Some crews, it's probably the same guy. The spotter will like point to something or, hey, check this out on the sideline. You have the truck that if there's some sort of flare-up like Tyron Matthew going, hey, we're going to come back with this. Here's the video. Here's how we're setting it up. But when you're actually calling the game as Joe Buck, I doubt you have, and I've only done a very little play-by-play, um, and it was a much lower level production. Minor League Baseball? Stuff that, Didn't you minor do- League Baseball also won Celtics game. So I might be the only person in history to do double A baseball and then one NBA game. I don't know. There's probably somebody else who's done it. So, uh, you know, don't build a statue right now. Uh, Well, you know, there's a staff for anything now. There is. There is. But I... I'm sure during the call of the game, there isn't really someone in your ear. Like certain studio shows that you would host, there's just different kinds of producers. Like some producers are great. They're you know really efficient and they would just say a few words. And then I've had producers that can't stop talking. And it's a hard thing to figure out how to like drive, be on TV, talk, and have a guy who's just long winded uh, in your ear the whole time. And that's when dude, you can I, I was on Amazon for like a month, like, and I didn't know they they were saying coming out of the gib or like some like slang jib. shit like that. That's the, the jib. The jib. Yeah, took me a month to figure out where the fuck the jib was. Uh, you know, they were just saying it, and I was like, Kay's got it. You know, Kay Adams, who's a yeah, terrific host, like. 
and I kind of saw from her, like in the studio, I can only imagine play by plays even harder, how many people are in her ear. And I'm hearing like, you know, I'm like, I have, to, if I had to lead this thing, I would just piss down my leg. Yeah. That's how I felt when I first was just, Hey, let's do it. And I wasn't really great at it. And then once I decided anybody that's ever on air, like once you just go, Hey, I'm pretty good. So I'm not going to worry about this anymore. And it took a while for me right. to do it. And then once I did that, right. I remember Josh Elliott was doing Sports Center. It was his first ever time anchoring anything. And he just, I remember Greeny, I guess, was on the desk with him. And he looked at Elliot and goes, hey, how many Sports Centers have you done? And he's like, this is my first one. <laughs> and Greeny just <laughs> looks at him. He's like, on the six o'clock going, they're just, this is it? And I said, how, you know, and I was younger. So I'm like, how did you deal with that? Like, that would have stressed me out. He goes, you know what? He goes, I figured... I look at it this way, very zen. He goes, no matter what happens, it's over in 60 minutes. No matter what happens, good or bad, the worst, really fulfilling. No, it doesn't That's matter. That's true, though. Yeah. Well, he, look, I don't know. Good for him. <laughs> it it might, good. You know what? But, it but totally nowadays, could have been lying. It be forever. It, it, it's forever. You say the wrong thing. You misspeak. You, you, yeah, you become a, a meme. Point. You enter the meme portal. Well, all I'm telling you is that it sounded really good. And I was younger and I was impressionable. <laughs> you were you know, nodding so your head. I was like, wow, this guy's really got to figure he it out. He was just like, yeah. When you walked out, he was like, the fucking kid thinks it's over after 60 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I was like, man, this is amazing. Okay. Let's do some Miami fun stuff. First observation was Barstool Sports in charge of sideline passes because those sidelines look packed. And after going to their party uh, for Rough and Rowdy, which... I can't tell you how much I appreciate the hookup from the guys who have always been really good to me. I don't know the last time I went to a party that bad, but we were there for about three minutes. It was overwhelming, and we had a table, and then somebody from Barstool was like, well, let's try to find your table, and it's me, Van Pelt, Stanford, Steve. Um, and I don't think anybody had had anything to drink, and we roll in, and we go... Well, what are we going to do? Tell 20 dudes to get out of our table? Like, this thing's chaos. Yeah. We're here way too late. And it was a monsoon. So we rolled in, $50 lift there, three minutes in, soaking wet, ruined shoes, $50 lift, right back to the Delano. That was, that was our same, Friday. Same experience across the street. I don't know how many years you got to go to Super Bowl parties to realize you shouldn't go to Super Bowl parties. I mean, Super Bowl parties are the one place – you can truly feel like what it feels like to be helpless in modern society. Like you can't get out if everybody lets out at the same time, or, you know, there's not enough Ubers to your point. There was like a hurricane that rolled into Miami Friday night and I'm kind of dreading drinking. And my wife and I, and, uh, Mike Bennett and Cliff Averill and, you know, a couple guys, we go to the SI party. I go in or no, when the SI party it was Shaq's party. Sorry. And, oh, fun you know, house. I, yeah. Who kid? The fun house. It was just overrun with people. And, you know, it took forever to get in. People standing in line in a driving rainstorm to get into a Super Bowl party. Rainstorm. That way, was I, like, like end of days stuff in some spots. Cars were I looked were like the notebook guy. I looked like, well, not, I didn't look like Gosling, Gosling? but I was, you know. Well, that's I was sweet. wet that way. You know, I was, I, <laughs> oh, yeah. it, 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 there was lightning, there were tornado oh, sirens, wow. and I'm looking at people like, luckily we have like a little bit of a VIP hookup so we can kind of get in quicker. Right. But I'm like, all right, I get that there are celebrities in there and I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to a party for no fucking reason. But there is absolutely no need to be standing out in the rain for 35 minutes, you know, with makeup on and dudes like uh, clothes that they got at the Fort Lauderdale Mall today. Um, you know, like... And and I go in there for 10 minutes and we leave, we leave, and um, <clears throat> then we can't get Ubers. Ubers, we're standing outside for an hour. There's literally a fucking tornado siren going off. We're all huddled, me and like 40 people, I don't know, underneath this overhang, and the rain starts coming sideways. Ubers are canceling. There's like cannibalism. People are crying. Uh, you know, there's there's stray dogs running around. It was the end of days, man. Like, Super Bowl parties, fuck Super Bowl parties. I vow, and you can hold me to this. You won't, but it's true. Party it's again. true. Because there's every every now and then, the EA Sports Party in Scottsdale is one of, I don't, I'm not going to say it's the single best party, but it was also crew-based, it was numbers-based, it was smaller, and to this day, the crew of like seven or eight of us 
still think it's one of the best nights we've ever had. And it just worked out. It was great. Florida Georgia Line was there. Stanford Steve was booing him off the stage. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but Florida Georgia Line broke up from their longtime manager. Uh, Damn, dude. But that's right. But that's what you do is you keep that's swinging the at music it. music a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That Those are your guys. Um, you keep doing it. So, like, I wanted to go to the, the Barstool thing because I love the boxing part of it. And I, and I like, but, and I, I don't mean to say it, but I think even they knew, like, this thing is chaos and it's overwhelming. And the, you were hitting me up being like, should I come? And we're like, we're already gone. We already are gone. We were there three minutes total. I think Steve grabbed Listen, one. Listen, I wasn't going to bring my wife to the, uh, to the, the, the methamphetamine boxing tournament. <laughs> well, I shouldn't have brought Van Pelt because Van Pelt's like, okay. And that was right after the wheels up dinner, which was great. Unbelievable. Shout out to Kenny and yeah. Gary and uh, a lot of shout outs here. We sat with Baker Mayfield. We had a dinner with Baker Mayfield. And Bake's a good dude. I, like, every time I meet Bake, he's cool as hell, dude. I, you know, so. They were meeting up with, they had to leave dinner because they were like, we're meeting up with Drew Locke, which I thought was fun. Yeah, well, Drew Locke uh, and, and, and Bake Legend. seemed pretty cool to me. Yeah, yeah I think Drew, Drew. I think Drew's going to be just fine. But I saw Shooter McGavin sitting out. It was, was that Shooter McGavin that went viral sitting out in the rain on like a picnic bench? You know, with the at that same you know where the F five tornado rolled through Miami. He was just sitting there soaked in a, in a button down t shirt, yelling at somebody on a cell phone outside the bar stool party. The Shooter just McGavin. drenched. Right, drenched, yeah. absolutely so drenched. So if Shooter McGavin can get stuck, anybody can get stuck. Like, you're helpless. It doesn't matter. You don't matter if you're at the Super Bowl. I got to admit, that one, that picture stung a little bit as an older guy. Because, like, sometimes, like, you and I, like, I just kept inviting everybody back to the hotel because I liked the hotel I stayed at. And then it was really easy for me to be like, all right, I'm out. I'm just going right upstairs. And that's yeah. what I did on the last night. Um, and the last night was great. We had a great crew. You got stuck in the tornado. Um but there was also, yeah, there was a part of the Shooter McGavin picture where I felt like, hey, that could be you in five years. You know, do you want to be 51, yeah. 56? Do you want to be 57? Yeah, what age do you stop doing those things? Yeah, I'm getting, I was with you one night just because I felt like you needed it and I owed it to you. So um, that was, that was pretty much the stretch. Oh, when we went out, yeah, we went out to the club. We did the yeah. club. Right. It was all cash. Which we I, were doing we were doing <laughs> beer at the club. <laughs> Remember, you they know, were like everybody. They were like sparklers. credit card. I'm holding six Coronas. <laughs> I went to the bar. Like I don't even want to tell the bottle service lady to get me anything. I'm too polite. I'm gonna go to the bar, say please and thank you. You don't need to put any sparklers on my Coronas. I'm I don't understand that. Six, try but, not to drop but, them. I don't know if it's because I look sketchy, but she goes, "No, we're cash." I'm like, "What? What are you talking about?" And I'm like, "Chris, do you have any money?" Um, give they were me, trying to get you, uh, they were trying to get all the older dudes out. Yeah, they definitely were like, Hey, kind of like at the door where they're like, how many dudes do you have with you? Yeah. They, they cash you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh no, man. For you, it's 20 bucks. Miami stories here in a second, but this winter start a new routine to upgrade your everyday life with a monthly box of awesome from bespoke post bespoke post sends guys only the best stuff every month. Whether you're looking to commemorate an occasion with a champagne saber or toast perfectly age winter cocktails, Box of Awesome has you covered. From style and grooming goods to barware, cooking tools, and outdoor gear, Box of Awesome has carefully built collections for every part of your life. If you need a throwing axe, done. If you need a cocktail stir, done. If you need hair products, always hurts to read that, done. They have it all. This is really for the female listeners out there. If you are a gift giver, right? I've recently learned that in relationships, <laughs> apparently people show their affection in different ways. I did, I did not know this. Um, I guess now looking back, I'm labeled as a gift giver. I never knew that. I never knew that before. Um, and honestly, the person that benefited the most from my relationships was Sarah Walsh because she would get the gifts when I just had no one else to buy them for this got depressing so let's keep reading start by taking the quiz at boxofawesome.com your answers will help them pick the right box of awesome for you they release new boxes every month across a ton of different categories it's free to sign up and you can skip a month or cancel anytime each box costs only 45 bucks but has over 70 dollars worth of gear inside get 20 percent off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code rusillo r-u-s-s-i-l-l-o at checkout that's boxofawesome.com code rusillo for 20 percent off your first box
Uh, give me, give me another, because I know you have another story that I pretty sure you can share. Just rankings of some dudes that would would drop into the ran into this guy. Um, and you already used Miles Teller, but I don't even know if you put him in your top five anyway. No, I see. Well, I know Miles, uh, and you know I got to interview him uh, for chalk, so that was cool. And Miles is a really regular dude. I guess for me, I, I, I you know. Every time I see Julius Peppers is pretty cool. So, you know, seeing That's Julius Peppers is cool. Yeah, well, no, I mean, he's a guy who treated me good since I've been in the league, and that's cool because he's my favorite player growing up. So any times I, I see Julius Peppers, it never, you know, it's cool to know him now, but, like, he's always going to be Julius Peppers. And then, like, Walter Jones, um, you know, I, I ran into Walter Jones at the hotel bar. He was – I had never met him. In my opinion, he might be the greatest offensive tackle of all time. And he walked up and had something nice to say and, like – you know, it's just, it's cool, you know, being at the Super Bowl because you get the, the weirdo celebrity factor where you get to, you're like, hey, is that Pee Wee Herman? That type of thing. Like, what the fuck is Pee Wee Herman doing Was here? Not that I saw Pee Wee Herman, but, uh huh. Paul Rubens? No. Oh, but I did. Okay, so, so I sat the, okay, NFL Honors was cool. You know, like I said, you see some like crazy weird celebrities and then you see like old teammates, which is really cool too. So you, you see people you hadn't seen in a while and then it's like people watching on steroids. And, you know, my wife and I, Meg, you know, we're pretty regular people, or I certainly don't think of myself as anybody special. We're sitting behind Sierra. It's, uh, it's Paul Rudd and his son. Cause he's a big cheese fan and everybody knows that by now. And then, uh, I'm sitting behind, uh, John Hamm. And John Hamm might be the coolest motherfucker I've ever seen. Like, do you, is John Hamm, do you, do you get yeah. that vibe? Like, John Hamm might be... No, it's confirmed. Confirmed. Guy's got a turtleneck on under the suit in Miami, just pulling it off. Like, just pulling it off. Also, shout out to John Burroughs High School, St. Louis. That's John Hamm's alma mater. Uh, so, like, just meeting people like that, seeing people like that is pretty cool because in the football world... You know, we're not like basketball players. We don't like, uh, unless you're some superstar, you don't rub elbows with, like, actors and shit. So um, that that's pretty cool. But, yeah, I, I don't know. Which, 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 which run-in are you thinking about? Had dinner with Kingsbury once. Um, that was great. He really was, like, incredible to talk to about Mahomes um, and kind of his whole year. You know, it's, it's not stuff I would share, but I – it's always that kind of thing, at least for me, because, look, I didn't play, but I'm around it all week. I've been doing this a long time, and there's just different ways that I'm going to be handled by some guys. So I've learned as I've gotten older, right. like, I'll let the other guy be cooler to me, and it's not like some standoffish thing. It's just when I was younger, I'd be like, oh, hey, I interviewed you once three years ago. You know, we're best yeah. friends now. You know, and honestly, I'm making fun of myself a little bit. Like, I still had enough self-awareness, but you just start to realize, like, certain dudes are like, nah, I'm good. And yeah. other guys are like, no, no, I, I know you, I've listened to you, I like you, I don't like you, or whatever, and there's some sort of connection. So as I've gotten I older, I just... like you? Yeah, hey, what's going on? I don't like you. You get like that you. a lot? No, not really. Not really. Uh, people like you, man. Like, I know some people don't like you, <laughs> but there are a lot of people that like you. <laughs> because so many people come up to me, so many people come up to me and said, yo, I really love you and Ryan. Like, Ryan's great at what he does, et cetera. And, you know, I, I wanted to keep a tally of all the big names that said this, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> but many people did. Dudes are saying that you're dudes great at saying, podcasting. Dudes dudes have argued that. Uh, <laughs> dudes have nah, argued that. I think, uh, I think, I think we're good. I, I, but, you know, look, you just get older and you just go, hey, you know what? Do your thing. So, hey, that was a great week, though. Miami is an awesome host town. 11 Super Bowls. I know it's not traditional to maybe some of the traditional writer types, but. And I know the stadium thing isn't isn't as convenient, you know. Whereas New Orleans, you and I are going to the title game, and it's like, man, you know, we we were totally lost, didn't know, change of clothes, quick change, where are the tickets? Ten minutes later, we're walking into the stadium, uh, no traffic, yeah. not really much of an issue, and that's something that you don't really have in a lot of cities. So New Orleans, that way is is unique. Miami is like ten cities in one, and uh, they're all called like. They're all like under the umbrella of Miami, but it's kind of a shit show that way. Um, but I still love it. There's no better place to be. I love the city. Yeah, to be able to just jump out and go hang out in the water for a couple hours and then go back and get into the mix. Uh, and I didn't have it as bad as, as you or some of the other guys where it was constant. So um, it was a good week. It was a really good week. I didn't week. do any body surfing this week. I didn't hit the, I didn't hit the, uh, the, the swells at all. 
but maybe next time when I get down here, I'll shred a little bit. Hey, great season, man. You were incredible to work with. Unless you want to do a Monday All-Star Game preview, uh, it may be a while. So you let me know. Um, you were so Is good at Bradley this. Is Bradley Beal going to be a topic in the All-Star preview? <laughs> That's all political, man. It's all political. Well, it was uh, a great year, Ryan. I appreciate it, man. My podcast dad really looked out for me all year. Uh, you helped me grow, buddy. You helped me grow. And again, make sure you check out Chalk Media or at Joel91 for all of the stuff that they're doing and all their Super Bowl recap stuff as well, like we said at the top of the podcast. So uh, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, buddy. Thanks. See you.